Well, it's really a great pleasure to be back at the University of Chicago. I, I taught here for a little bit over 11 years, and coming from uh, an, an environment where both my wife and I grew up on 200 acres in isolated uh, border south Missouri, it was kind of tough on both of us to deal with the city life, so I had to reluctantly give it up. But I've always told people that the University of Chicago is the most exciting place on earth, and the economics department is just fantastically exciting. It's just like, uh, it's, it's like drugs, but it's legal. And you can <laughs> consume as much as you want of it, and you won't end up in jail. And I keep expecting the, uh, the, uh, the drug enforcers in Washington, D.C. To, to come in and inspect the economics department at the University of Chicago for generating so much excitement uh, that, you know, there's got to be something that's uh, illegal here. Well, <clears throat> any rate, today I'm going to be talking about ecology. So this beat-up hat is my ecology hat. So, so we do a lot of work outside looking at ecosystems. And so since I'm inside, I'll take this off. It's pretty disgusting. But one advantage of a hat like that is that if you stomp on it or sit on it or squash it, it just bounces back. So it's perfect for outdoor work. Now what, you, what I'm going to talk about is uh, some work I've been doing on early warning signals. And the way this work progresses is that uh, we first build models and then we try out the theory in models. That's the first step. And then the second step is a lot of researchers around the world have been trying out the theory on microbial systems. So you can control a lot of variables that go on in a microbial controlled laboratory system. And then, and then the next stage is to actually try some uh, experiments, my uh, colleague, uh, Steve Carpenter there, who's, who I swipe these slides from, is a limnologist, and he's actually done whole lake experiments to test the theory that I'm going to be talking about. And, and there, you, there's a lot of variables you can't control. And so, so uh, that's the terrain that I'm going to take you over, and so you'll all get a, a lot of relief from economics because we'll probably only get to economics towards the last of the talk, and I want to leave a, plenty of time for questions because I think when I lay this stuff out, you're going to have a ton of questions. Okay, so basically what you're looking at there on that slide is a dust storm in Mars that just developed just kind of like out of nowhere. Where, where the hell did it come from? It's kind of like some kind of regime change that just happened all of a sudden. So, so we're going to be looking at uh, ecological systems where there's abrupt changes of state. So there's multiple states for these systems. And, and some of the states are good that you'd like to have. And when I get to lakes, I'll explain a rather pungent and rather smelly example uh, of a bad state, which is a highly eutroph eutrophied lake where there's actually too much food for noxious organisms, uh, and you get these uh, fish kills, and you get uh, slimy algae, and you've even had uh, water disasters, uh, like in Toledo, for example. Uh, dogs, if they drink uh, water when you have a big bloom of uh, the wrong kind of algae, it could kill your dog. So this is a, a bad situation. When the Native Americans were here, Lake Mendota, for example, was so clean, you could go out on a boat and look down and you could see clear gravel, maybe 30, 40 feet down. It's not like that now. Okay, so let me uh, zip through this. So those are the topics, and so we're gonna hit regime shifts and critical transitions first. And so here's some examples. Uh, lakes, rangelands, coral reefs, and what you're looking at here, this is a particularly interesting one right here. Here is a rangeland that's actually got edible, edible grazing food on it. And then here's a rangeland that's dominated by woody shrubs, which is just basically worthless. And I was in Zimbabwe 
uh, some years ago, and I actually saw an experiment where on one side of a fence, we're going to get to uh, some grazing of sheep in the next few slides down the pike, and a rangeland that was appropriately grazed uh, would maintain this stable state that you're looking at here, where it's productive and there's plenty of food for the sheep to eat. But as you gradually increase the number of sheep per acre, this is what you'll end up get, getting. And there's a tendency for ranchers and other operators of these uh, human-dominated ecosystems. You know, everything looks like it's fine. You know, so I, I grew up uh, running cattle. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so when we were grazing cattle, you know, if we were grazing the, the number of head that was not too high on, the, on our rangelands, uh, we could keep it looking like that. But of course, we didn't know ecology. We're just a bunch of dumb ranchers. So, so we would just gradually increase the number of cattle, and, and then you could end up with something like that. And so this was an experiment uh, done in uh, Australia. Uh, by Australian range scientists. And so, two steady states. There's a good steady state, there's a bad steady state. Uh, <clears throat> we'll look at lakes a little bit in the, in the next, so let me go to the next slide here. Okay, so in the rangeland story, so you're grazing, you know, lightly grazing, and then you're heavy grazing, once you flip the rangeland into this bad, stable state, there's an effect what, that scientists call hysteresis, that if I start taking the sheep out to go back to only two sheep per, per unit, the rangeland's gonna, gonna stay like this. It, it's stuck in that bad, stable state, so you don't wanna get there. So, so a, a picture, kind of a little bit of the, uh, this is a kind of an iconic graph that we use to, to teach this material. Uh, so, so you have a, have a curve, and this curve is, a, this, uh, just watch that line zero. So as you uh, have four sheep per acre, uh, your curve is high like that, and the system is sitting over here. That's a good place for the system to be sitting, right, right there. And then as you add the number of sheep, you don't see anything going wrong. The system's still in a good stable state. And then you add five sheep per acre. That turns out to be critical in this little toy cartoon of what's going on in a very complicated system. And then if you add one more sheep per acre, you flip down into this bad state here, and that's that rangeland you were looking at that had nothing but woody shrubs in this iconic picture. So then the idea is, is that as the sheep density approaches that critical point, uh, that point right there, the, uh, something's gonna happen. The first thing is, is that the net growth rate of the grass is going to kind of start dropping down towards zero. You're not getting, you're not getting much growth. And then uh, we're going to be looking at what happens if you shock the system a little bit, because there's always shocks hitting a real, real life system, even in the, these laboratory systems that, that, uh, that I'll be talking about a little bit if I get time. Uh, there's even shocks to laboratory equipment. You know, you have to keep the room temperature constant and all of that kind of thing that affects the growth rate of organisms. And so, so what happens is, is that the return rate uh, from small disturbance, disturbances takes a long time to return. So if I shock it from, the, from where the system is, it takes a long time to go back as it's getting closer and closer to criticality. And I'll keep returning to that theme later and more and more because that's what, uh, that's the kind of the, the basis of how we're building a theory of early warning systems, of early warning signals for these kinds of systems. And we'll, we'll keep uh, returning to that, but that's just kind of a basic theme that's gonna be coming up. And so 
So the, one of the signals that Carpenter and I used is that we looked at, uh, at variance because return rate didn't have the, as nice as statistical sampling properties as variance does. So, so you basically, you're watching the variance of vegetation. So you have to take measurements very, very continually to pick up an early warning signal of, of, of these systems, of, of an impending flip to a bad state. And so the idea is, is to watch this local measure of variance that I'm going to be talking about. And, and that gives you an early warning signal that you're kind of pushing the system a little too hard. And you better, you better back off. OK, so, so, uh, so that's just kind of uh, going through the same, same story that I told earlier. Then what happens is, is that the standard deviation of the, of, the, uh, of the vegetation measurements. So you have to take continual measurements of vegetative biomass uh, so that you see how the uh, rangeland is responding as you keep adding more and more sheep. And then the variance of this local measure of biomass, vegetative biomass fluctuation, will be kind of flat. And when you see it start rising, you'd better back off. You'd better back off, and and you better not add any more sheep, or you're probably going to lose your rangeland. So we're going to be talking about the same kind of thing for lakes. So, so let me go, go through the food chain of a lake. So the food chain of, of a lake, like in uh, in uh, in Wisconsin, where I live, is you have hyper predators. A lot of them come from Illinois. They're otherwise known as fishermen. Those are hyper predators. Okay, they take off the exciting game fish, the muskies and the walleyes. And those fish are called piscivorous fish. They eat other fish. Then the kind of boring fish that people like us from the border south eat are perch. And, and so remember the piscivorous fish eat the perch and eat the minnows. And then those fish, the planktivorous fish, the perch, the minnows, they eat the zooplankton. And the zooplankton are little organisms that eat the algae. Now, who feeds the algae? Uh, most of it uh, comes from agriculture. So you look at the, uh, at the basin, uh, the, uh, the catch basin of Lake Mendota, you can actually see maps of this on the Carpen on Stephen Carpenter's limnology website at Madison. You can see that 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 basin, and there are calculations done by limnologists using uh, contingent valuation studies on how much people are willing to pay to clean up Lake Mendota just halfway. The numbers are as astounding. It's you could actually afford to buy out the farmers in, in the catch basin of Lake Mendota. I mean, that is absolutely astounding. I mean, I'm still in the agricultural business, and, and I can tell you what the profit margins are. They're extremely <laughs> low in my, in my business. So, but yet, you know, why can't you do that? You know, well, there's a lot of impediments, you know, that have, and I won't go into the, they're kind of boring. The, the science is much more interesting than the impediments, why you can't do that. Okay, so, so the lake eutrophication model goes like this. You got, you got the, 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 the problem is, is phosphorus sequestered in soil. That, that's the problem. A lot of phosphorus actually gets sequestered in mud. In a, in a lake system like, like Lake Mendota. So then when you get a, a windy day and the waves uh, uh, are roiled by the wind, well, that actually can pull up sedimented phosphorus in the bottom of the lake. And then that's kind of what makes the lake cloudy and mucky. And so, so if you're a lake doctor, you know, looking at this model, the model kind of tells you what you need to do for, to uh, save the lake. Uh, so, so, I, 
So before I get into that picture, let me just draw you by speaking in Italian with my hands, with my uh, lovely small hands. And, and so, so speaking in Italian, the hyper predators are the, the uh, sports fishermen. And I'll stand over here so you can see. So the hyper predators are at the top of the food chain. One thing I can do to fix the lake, or at least make an attempt to fix it, is to knock off the hyper predators. That's one way of doing it. Let me talk through that, what happens. I knock off the hyper predators. Planktivorous fish, uh, the piscivorous fish now explode in population. Remember that those are the fish that eat other fish. So now, the, as the piscivorous fish, the, the muskies, the walleyes, explode in population, how many planktivorous fish are there going to be? Answer, not many. So what's going to happen to zooplankton? Man, they're going to have a bonanza. So what is it that they eat? The algae. And if they eat the algae, you get clear water. That's one thing you can do as a lake doctor. But so far, even the state of Wisconsin has not put a bounty out on people from Illinois. <laughs> they want your money, just don't stay. OK, then, <laughs> then, then uh, what's the other thing you can do as a lake doctor? Well, I can work on the ground, ground level. So how do I work on that? Well, I can uh, put the hammer down on agriculture because most of the pollution comes, the phosphorus comes from agriculture. Each cow, uh, you know, dumps uh, in one day the amount of manure that's uh, 20 times a human. So you can have a CAFO, a confined animal, feeding operation that uh, you know would have, say, 3,000 cows, so you can work out for yourself how much manure that is, a, a lot. And you can count up the number of cows in Mendota's catch basin and work out roughly how much phosphorus goes in through the, in the watershed, gets deposited into the lake mud, and, and now, that's a lot of food for algae. So the algae explode in population, overwhelm the ability of the zooplankton to eat it, and so on up the food chain. And if you have fisher, fishermen on the top end, and you've got farmers on the bottom end, and green lawns, a lot of it's green lawns, uh, so you can't blame it all on agriculture. I resent it when they blame us for all of it. I'm in agriculture, after all. So, so it's a family business. So, but, but, you know, so, so you get the idea. So that's how the food, food chain works. So now suppose you're, you see that Lake Mendota is really clear, like it was in, in, uh, when the Native Americans. So now you start adding, take more of the piscivorous fish, uh, agriculture grows, everything looks fine. So you got a same picture, same picture as in the sheep example. It's essentially the same, same picture. So then what we're interested in is seeing an early warning signal. When are we pushing, stressing the lake ecosystem too hard? When are we stressing it too hard? We want to find an early warning signal so that we can really try to convince people you got to back off because once the lake flips, it's going to be like that rangeland I showed you. It's going to be eutrophic, stinky. You're going to get fish kills during the summertime. And all of those expensive properties that ring Lake Mendota are not going to be worth as much and swimming, you're going to be covered with slime, so, so that you don't want that to happen. OK, so this picture here ex explains a little bit of the science that's, uh, that was uh, run from an article of ours. And if you get interested in this stuff, 
if you just type my name into Google Scholar, all of the papers with Carpenter, that's where all the early warning signal papers are. So if you get interested in looking at any of this stuff to see what it's like to actually try to turn these kind of qualitative uh, literary type ideas into quantitative science and how it's actually tested, you'll, you'll get a good idea there. So this is a, th this picture here is, is from, a, from an article where, where we had actually simulated a bunch of models that mimic what's going on in the lake. And just to see, and so this diagram up here is kind of like the sheep diagram, but what happens is, is that as you uh, keep adding more and more phosphorus sequestered in algae, so because the phosphorus sequestered in mud is roiled up into the lake water, into the water column, and so phosphorus is sequestered in algae. So as you keep increasing the amount of phosphorus sequestered in algae, the lake is still what's called oligotrophic. It's still relatively clean until you pass this critical point, and then uh, uh, a few years later, uh, it's, it's trapped in this uh, nasty, stable state up here where it's smelly and stinking. So then as you try to pull the stuff back, you say, oh, 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 we got to back, we got to back down. You back down further and further and further. We backed it down to where it was clean before. We backed it down to where it was clean before, but it's just still stinking the high heaven. So you have to pull it way, 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 way back until you drop back down to the good state that's the phenomenon of hysteresis. So let me repeat, uh, go through that story again. This is kind of the heart of what we do, really. So we do model experiments first. This is stage one, and then I'll get to stage two right shortly, where we actually look at living systems. So, so you, you keep adding more and more phosphorus, sequestered in algae. The model lake flips to a bad state. This is where it's stinking. So then we pull it back, pull it back, pull it back, pull it back, and then that's hysteresis. Okay, the next picture we'll look at, uh, this was uh, simulations that we did. So you can see that most of the, most of the mass, then it kind of starts leaking out. You know, because the lakes, the model lakes being shocked like it is in the real world. You know, it's windy days. There's long periods of uh, hot days when the algae really grows fast. And then uh, when you get close to the critical point, and then it's just starting to flip over. But there's still a lot of noise in it. But notice how the variance is growing. See, the variance is growing as you get closer and closer to the danger point. Okay, so that's just a, that's just a kind of a, a, a box diagram of the model. And I want to speed through this stuff because I want to tell you about some living systems. So that's kind of more of the same. And, and that's a forecasting that we've done. And you can kind of see that, that uh, it, it's getting worse. And this is a bunch of kind of technical experiments. Now, people have been trying to apply this to the climate. Everybody's interested in climate nowadays. This picture here shows you the Holocene. The Holocene is a 10,000-year period of very small climate fluctuations. That's what made it possible for agriculture to develop and for humans to develop. The Holocene is essentially why we're here. Uh, notice that, that uh, in the Holocene period of about 10,000 years, you know, these are thousands of years before present. Notice how choppy the climate was way in the distant past. And so agriculture basically begun in the Holocene, and uh, you had enough climate stability so that we could thrive as humans. Now, people want to try to apply this material that I've been working on in the last quite a few years to the climate system. And I'll just be uh, skeptical. I'm skeptical about that. That's a system that there's still a lot of uncertainty. In fact, Lars and I have been wrestling with, with uh, dealing with climate change uncertainties. It's a, 
it, it's just too many uncertainties. So let me turn to systems where there's not so much uncertainty. Uh, these systems here, uh, before I get to that, people have tried to apply this stuff. There's actually work going on in the Netherlands applying it to epileptic seizures. They're trying to put instruments on people, on patients that are su subject to epileptic seizures to see if there's a variance in the measurements coming off of these, in these instruments. And if the variance is increasing, you know, hey, you know, you better get ready for a seizure and take intervention action to try to prevent it. I think there's something, too, that I have more faith that you might get something out of this. Uh, there's people who have actually been uh, using it on uh, studying heart attacks, um, uh, essentially watching measurements of people, uh, uh, kind of continuous biomarkers uh, of people that are, have serious heart problems. And there, there's, th that might go somewhere. Where I'm really skeptical is, is market breakdowns. I know this is an economic audience, but there's an old saying in, in finance where I have done a lot of work in the past in writing articles that if it can be published, if, if it's published, uh, then what happens after it's published ought to remain invariant. There's an invariance principle because otherwise, you know, people would have traded on it and removed the phenomenon that you're talking about in the first place. In other words, I'm just restating the efficient markets hypothesis made famous at Chicago in uh, plain English, uh, rather than going through Martingale theory and all of that and going through strong, semi-strong, and so on. Uh, it's basically, in fact, I had one student who became quite famous and extremely wealthy that said if he actually discovered anything in finance when he was a student of mine here at Chicago, he wasn't going to publish it uh, until he tried it out trading. And then if he didn't make any money on it, he would publish it. <laughs> so I, I'm very skeptical about it. I'm perfectly happy to take a lot of questions and discuss finance since I've worked in it for so many years. Uh, and I'm still fascinated by finance. Can't help but be fascinated. Where else, as a mathematician, I know there's probably at least one mathematician in the audience, financial systems are so fascinating to me because basically the, the way of modeling them is to write down uh, uh, strategies in a very large space and then what happens before you implement strategies, everybody competing with each other, has to remain invariant after people implement their strategies trading with each other. So in a mathematical problem, it becomes a mapping from a, a very large space of functions into another large space of functions and proper solutions for financial economics are a fixed point of this mapping. So, I mean, it gets really technical. I just love it. If mathematicians like me uh, suck that stuff up, you know, that's what keeps us, makes us get up in the morning. Uh, but this stuff's fun, too, because, so, Carpenter has the kind of a wicked sense of humor, so you can see from that slide. <laughs> so then, so then I'll just keep on stepping through here. Uh, this is when uh, there were four of us that kind of stumbled on to this basic idea. And the media got hold of, of this story and made a big noise out of it. There were four of us in Tobago that were thinking about these problems. And one of them is uh, Martin Scaffer, who's, in, who's also a musician. And there's me doing some ecological identification uh, work in Melalongwe, which is uh, in Zimbabwe. And then there's Steve Carpenter. And uh, Buzz Holling is a very famous ecologist who was, he'd seen this puzzle in some experiments that he'd been running with the spruce budworm. The spruce budworm is a nasty uh, pest of, uh, of a boreal forest. And he was trying to understand uh, what the devil was going on in these tremendous models. And he noticed the variance was kind of increasing before the budworms would just spread out and destroy. Canadian forests and these models of Canadian forestry that he was working with. And so I, I suggested, you know, hey, you know, it might be, it might just have something to do with the fluctuation dissipation theorem of physics. And uh, let me explain 
that in, in plain, in Italian again with my hands. Imagine I draw a, uh, so you're, you're looking at a, a rubber, a rubber uh, piece of uh, rubber that extends like this. So this piece of rubber, I'll have it like this and like that. In this piece of rubber, there's a ball right here. And this piece of rubber is being juggled by the outside nature, shocking it. Now, very slowly, this piece of rubber is getting flatter over here. But this is a good state where I want to keep my ball. So the ball is jiggling around in this, uh, in this uh, well, of uh, this piece of rubber. But nature is slowly changing uh, the, uh, the depth of that well, of this piece of rubber over here. And I don't want the ball to fall in here. That's bad. So as this piece of rubber is being jiggled by nature, the ball starts vibrating more and more. And as it gets flatter and flatter, the ball has a bigger chance of falling into the bad state. That's the fluctuation dissipation of physics explained in Italian. So, so there's the picture right there. So here, here's the picture I was explaining by, by uh, waving my hands a lot. And so, so nature is uh, pushing. You notice that the variation of this ball, it wants to stay in that, that well right there. And then as nature pushes it up and flattens it out, I don't want it to fall in there. That's bad. So, so as it flattens out, you can see that it's going to vibrate more. And there goes up the variance. So that, that's the simple idea of, of what we're doing. Now, you might say, uh, well, God, you know, hell, you don't need four PhDs at Tobago uh, to do that. Well, here's where it starts getting nasty. Uh, real systems have many many dimensions. So we do this in n dimensions. And I wrote a mathematical appendix to a, a, uh, an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy where I took the set of differential equations that describes uh, the models that we've been working with. And so there's n differential equations and n unknowns. And this set of differential equations is being pushed by a slow variable that's, uh, that's kind of doing the equivalent of tuning, tuning the, the well of that landscape, except that there isn't any landscape. It's just a set of differential equations. Uh, even though ecologists and many natural scientists talk about landscapes, a landscape does not exist unless a certain technical condition on uh, the cross-partial derivatives of the laws of motion of your differential equations is satisfied. There has to be a certain symmetry condition that's satisfied. It's technical. I'm not going to bore you with it, but it has to be. So there isn't any landscape. And uh, the landscape is only a metaphor. In actual nature, there is no landscape. OK, so then what, what I basically did is that I did some mathematics where I got a, a, a what's called a local expansion, or a small noise expansion. And then I had to look at this big variance matrix. And then I basically developed an ordering on, on matrices, which is well known in the advanced mathematical literature, and then showed that the whole matrix gets bigger in the sense of this ordering. And then that matrix getting bigger, that's corresponding to what you see in that picture there. OK, so we'll just keep zipping along here. So, uh, so this will just be a quick review of the, of the food chain. Uh, now, there's an interesting thing that happens in food chains that it's uh, an extra in, uh, ingredient that I didn't tell you about. And that's a trophic triangle. Uh, a trophic triangle is where fish eat their own young. So part of the food for, for many fish is their own children. Uh, some economists have joked uh, with me that running up huge national debt is kind of, kind of like a trophic triangle. <laughs> That's a bad joke. <laughs> okay, so here, here's, 
here's the food chain. So there's the fisherman and eating the fish. And then this fish here eats the planktivorous fish. And then the cannibalism and the trophic triangle is uh, these are really small. That's, that's the young. Fish have lots of, lots of children. Their idea is, is to have scads of them and hope that one survives. And so, so this is just manipulating the food chain, kind of like what I told you earlier, that if you're going to be a lake doctor, there are two ways to try to, try to fix a lake. And these just give you an idea of the organisms that I've been talking about. That, that's a zooplankton there. And so this is just kind of showing uh, the food chain stuff. And so now, to be a lake doctor, to review a little bit of what I talked about, you can either work on the bottom end, so you can try to reduce the amount of phosphorus that's sequestered in algae and in mud. So you can work on that end. Uh, you can actually work on this. You can create refuges. Uh, and so there's a strange thing that happens when people go up to the North Woods. They'll spend a lot of money, buy a lake property, and then the first thing they'll do is remove the biology. So they'll basically remove all the coarse woody debris. They'll put in a green lawn, and the coarse woody debris is what helps support the fishing. That if they were interested in fishing and, and fish species in the first place. So that's what this is about. Is you can make interventions in to try to educate people. In fact, Carpenter spends a lot of time on uh, sort of what you might call lake forums, where people get together, like we're doing here, and we talk about how to solve lake problems, how to clean up our lakes. And, and so Carpenter explains the limnology, and then he even has models uh, partially inspired by some of the stuff that we've been doing, where people uh, that own lake property would do play the role of simulating. So you simulate lake games, and then they get to understand the biology of the lake by doing that. So the, let me tell you about this lake experiment. This is a very interesting experiment. So now, this is the biggest system that the early warning theory has been tested out on. This is the biggest system. I'm going to have to wind up here fairly quickly. Uh, and the biggest system is uh, these lakes are about the size of farm ponds. So before I explain what the Carpenter team did, I want to tell you about interesting experiments done by the Jeff Gore Lab at MIT. So that's spelled G-O-R-E, just like Al Gore, no relation. And if you just type into Google Jeff Gore, It'll take you right there. You probably don't even have to type in lab MIT. I mean, this guy, is, his work has gotten so much attention. So here's what he's done. He's taken microbial systems. Uh, one of them was yeast cells, and the other one was uh, an, another, another type of mi microbe. And then, so for the other type, the experiment he wanted to do was to stress the system by removing the food from the, from the lab system to drive the system down to what's called a, a, a critical depensation point, where if the population falls below that point, it collapses. And then what he did is he monitored the variance of the population of the organisms as he titrated the stress and just made the stress get a little bit tighter and tighter and tighter. And sure enough, the variance went up. So that was uh, one of the first experiments done on living systems. Now, my, you, but it's a controlled lab system. So what about an uncontrolled system? Well, this experiment is the first one I know of. So the way this experiment worked, there were actually three lakes. Uh, you only see two of them here. And they were named Paul Lake and Peter Lake. And I asked him, is the third lake named Mary? But it wasn't, and I said you should correct that. So what they did is for the first lake, uh, one of them's a control lake, 
And then the other one is the experimental leg. And then what they did is they just manipulated the food chain of the experimental leg and left the control leg the same. And they actually took it through the hysteresis loop that I showed you. And then they looked to see if the variance of critical organisms in the lake increased. Now the time series that they produced looked pretty messy because there's a lot of shocks and stuff going on. And, but I guess, I guess I'm still somewhat skeptical. I'm just a, a, just a very negative person, I guess. But everybody in the limnology literature finds the evidence pretty convincing for the, for the theory. That's just pictures of the team. And so this is kind of what some of the time series look like and uh, plots that the team drew. And you know, I, I don't know. It looks messy as hell to me. Uh, but, they, but when they extract the uh, signal out of all of this noise, whether it's some kind of a smooth variance that they use time series technology to extract, they argued that the variance indeed increased. And I guess I would bet 70-30, uh, you know, 74-30. Thirty against that some future study might overturn their work. So I want to quit now so that there's plenty of time for questions and also to get you out of here in time to go uh, get to the right sports bar for the Cubs game. I'm going to assert my authority here and ask one first. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, you know, you've done a lot of work on, on, on dynamics in general and, 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 and applied to economic systems. And you've done this work here, you're talking about early warning signals. Um, I, I, I want to come back to that slide where you, where you made some references to economic systems. Are there some insights to these early warnings which, would be, which, which you think might be relevant for economic systems and what lessons there might be there for th thinking how we should model them in better ways? Uh, I think. Uh I think there is actually a, a, a co-author of mine, uh, Stephen Durloff, and I worked on uh, peer groups uh, where uh, people are copying each other's behavior, uh, like uh, wearing your baseball cap with the bill back or wearing it with a forward like this. So, so uh, what governs the dynamics of the fraction? Of people wearing the baseball cap with Bill back or Bill forward, you know. So that's a a, a fashion thing. And when I was uh, doing consulting in New York uh, in my financial days, working on Wall Street, I saw dilly boppers one time just appearing out of nowhere in New York. Everybody was walking around with dilly boppers. Okay, now, you know what drives those kind of uh, fashion? So the the dynamics were kind of like the the uh, storm on Mars, it's kind of like it goes out of nowhere. So when, when will it not be fashionable anymore to wear your, your baseball cap with a bill backward rather than forward? Well, you can write down dynamical models that actually make some economic sense of, of such phenomena. And then since uh, there's all kinds of uh, noise being hit, the, hitting the social system, I think there might be a chance that someday somebody's going to do a study and apply this early warning stuff and come up with a signal that the variance in the fraction of people that are following the fashion, especially as it begins to die and switch to another fashion, uh, that there may be an increase in variance on that. I have looked at early signals in finance where we actually tested a whole bunch of uh, technical trading models. And uh, so people, you know, uh, uh, technical traders, you know, use all these moving average type rules to try to extract a signal when the market's gonna, gonna turn. And uh, I did this with LeBaron, who, Blake LeBaron, who comes from a very prominent financial family. So we're very skeptical about this stuff but we also had a behaviorist that was on the, on the team. So we argued about this all the time. I took a straight Chicago position 
that any signal that you saw if you traded on it, you'd end up with holes in your shoes unless you were a total insider where you didn't have to pay any commission at all. I mean, zero. It had to be flat zero. Uh, LeBaron was kind of in between, and the behaviorists thought that you know we were actually finding something. Well, we found there's this, there's this faint signal, uh, especially if it was, quote, confirmed by volume, uh, and that, 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 that you actually did see something, but it was very momentary. It was kind of like a, a momentary pocket of, of uh, temporary predictability. And then later on, the structure of the markets changed, and so when LeBaron redid all of this stuff, that particular signal disappeared. And that's essentially my point that I keep returning to, that in financial systems, there may be a momentary signal, you know, something's paying for those towers you see on Wall Street. But for the rest of us, you know, we have to pay commissions. And, and there, you know, I, I took the position that there was no profit uh, on trading on this particular signal. Now, there are some certain thin markets in less developed countries that are a pleasure to trade in, but that's, that's a different issue. <laughs> I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about climate change. Have, have there been any claims of early warning signals, and what are the uncertainties that concern you? Okay, there's, a, there's a articles by Martin Scheffer, one of the four, uh, four guys in Tobago. Uh, he's actually got a group in Wageningen University in the Netherlands where they've actually looked at climate change. and. There's, uh, there's some events uh, where, where the climate changed drastically over a 50-year period. Uh, I can't pronounce the uh, Swedish and Norwegian names of these events, but sometimes you'll see them under the title of interstadial, interstadial events. And they were very abrupt. And so what these guys did, Martin Scheffer, S-C-H-E-F-F-E-R, and his team did, is they actually looked at, at variance and the rate of return to equilibrium called uh, critical slowing down in physics. And they saw what they claimed some evidence before these abrupt change events, that they saw an increase in variance and uh, a slowdown in, in return rate of, of the system. I'm somewhat skeptical, but I'm willing to be convinced. I think you should never shut off any line of inquiry, you know, but always, always keep asking questions. Uh, and there have been articles written that are critical of our work. Uh, there's a guy named Dit Ditlevsen, D-I-T-L-E-V-S-E-N, that has argued that in some of the systems, uh, not the ones that I discussed here tonight, I think we're on pretty sound ground. Even the lake system, you know, since they were small systems and we could really see a lot of detail. You know, I'm pretty convinced. That's why I say 70-30, which is good for me. Uh, now, what are the big uncertainties? Well, here's an example. There's a very, very prominent team of uh, climate scientists uh, uh, led by a guy named H. Damon Matthews. And they took 11 big models. And these models are used by the IPCC. Uh, so they're pretty respectable. And they're big models. And what they did is they fed anthropogenic emissions into each one of these big models. And they looked at how the global mean average yearly temperature that the model cranked out increased as you increase cumulative anthropogenic emissions. What they found was that each model delivered a rather beautiful scaling curve that where the uh, global mean increase temperature increased linearly with cumulative anthropogenic emissions. I mean, very striking. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that the slope of those scaling relationships varies a lot across the big models. Now, whose big model is the most respectable? I mean, 
Now that's that 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 troubles me. So I gave uh, Lars had given a talk at, at Minnesota on the work that we've been doing, and then I decided to be obnoxious like I like to be, uh, because a lot of people spend a lot of time computing damage functions or trying to compute damage functions. I said, suppose we do something like the following. Suppose we just let the climate science community tell us how many degrees can the planet tolerate? You know, two degree increase? I mean, people like that number. So let me say, you know, three degrees. That's all we can take. Okay, then I wanted to use the Matthews et alias stuff. So let's say that uh, 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 here's a typical parameter from their, their group that, that uh, if you inject a teraton of carbon into the atmosphere, uh, the uh, global mean yearly temperature will go up 1.7 degrees centigrade. Okay, but some of the models cranked out 2 degrees, some of them cranked out 2.1 or 2.2, some of them, you know, smaller. Okay, now if I only had one model, or, or this model is the one that's the gold standard, then for two degrees, I could tell you what your carbon budget is, and then we economists could get on with doing stuff that we're really good at. We could tell you the best way to implement that carbon budget. But since every one of these stinking 11 models <laughs> gives you a difference, so then I say, let me be conservative. Lars and I have been working with this robust stuff. What do you want to do if you're going to be conservative about this? Well, let's take uh, the worst model. Let's say it's 2.1 degrees you know, per teraton. Then I tick off 3 degrees is all the planet can tolerate get the intersection point of that curve, that's your robust carbon budget. And then we economists would get busy doing what we're good at. We would design the best economical way to meet that budget. Well, of course, the people that calculate damage functions, they didn't care too much for that. you know. But, but sometimes when I get really depressed, I say, let's do that, for Christ's sakes. But that's only when I get really depressed, because my nature is to compute damage functions like everybody else. You know. Your skepticism that you mentioned at the beginning about a duplication on finance and financial systems. Now, you mentioned some work having to do with how we follow trends. I'm thinking that could be applied to any network uh, analysis, such as when are people going to leave Facebook and the, and the like. Um, but I'm curious to know maybe why you why you have the initial skepticism and whether that has to do with uh, people not acting in that context like sheep grazing on, on, the, on the grass. Oh, okay, yeah. I guess the main reason why I'm skeptical of the ability of picking up a signal, I'm not really skeptical that there can be abrupt changes, not like we've had financial cri crises and crashes and so on. Uh, but you know, picking up an early warning signal uh, that that uh, it any early warning signal you pick up, if you have competitive trading uh, people trading trying to trade on it, and it's observable publicly, so then prices adjust. You know, like in the efficient markets hypothesis, and then the signal tends to get removed. Now you can actually find contradictions to the efficient markets hypothesis. You know, I don't want to be dogmatic on that. But what's hard to find is a signal uh, that kind of uh, re re would remain long enough to be able to see it. Whereas in these ec ecological systems, you know, the, sis the uh, signal can remain quite sturdy uh, and you'll see it uh, quite clearly. Whereas in financial systems, when LeBaron and Lekonshock and I worked on this, there's just so much noise surrounding the signal that you just can't hardly see anything. It's very fa faint. So you need pretty sophisticated methods to extract the signal from the noise. In fact, there's even a fairly prominent National Academy member in atmospheric science that argues that for the climate problem that you're interested in, that the signal is, uh, is so small relative to the noise that we shouldn't get bent out of shape about it. <laughs> 